Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the League of California Cities webinar entitled, entitled The New Workplace During COVID-19 Pandemic. COVID-19 has rapidly changed the way that cities operate. And in order to meet these moments, the League has been producing the, this series of webinars so that you have an opportunity to learn from other cities. So please ask questions and participate in this webinar. As city employees slowly start returning to work, HR directors are enacting workplace protocols to keep their employees safe. From work schedules to keeping morale high, our HR directors today will be discussing how they are planning to bring their employees back to the office. Next slide. Today, it's okay. Next slide is, oh, Lord. just go back in the presentation mode. There we go. Oh, gosh. Next, oh, enter. Gosh. There we go. <laughs> so today we have two amazing HR directors. We have Lisa Murphy, HR director for the city of Santa Cruz and Allison Hawk, HR Director for the City of Monterey. Next slide. Before we get started, let me tell you some little housekeeping. Uh, if you are planning on speaking today, please make sure that your audio is connected. You can tell if your audio is connected by going to the bottom of your screen and clicking on audio settings. Just to let you know, all of you are muted. We will also be recording this webinar and hosting it on the league's website at cacities.org backslash coronavirus. And you can also find our previous webinars there. Now how to ask a question. Our HR directors, uh, Lisa and Allison, really wanna hear from you and see what you're doing in your cities. There are two ways to ask a question. First is verbally. Go to the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. And when, at the end of the presentation, We'll call on you um, and unmute you. The second way is using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So just make sure you type in your name, your city, and your title, and we will get to your question. Now, we only have an hour for this webinar, and I know that you have a lot of questions, so we will try to make time for all your questions, but I can't promise we'll answer every single one, but we will try. So without further ado, I do want to turn it over to our HR directors, Lisa and Allison. Lisa? Good morning, everybody. I'm Lisa Murphy, Human Resources Director for the City of Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. I also serve on the League's uh, Personnel Employee Relations Department as the Vice President with the League of California Cities. I know your time is precious, and we want to get to all of your questions, so we'll go through uh, our slides of uh, returning to, to, to work. And many of you probably are already in this process. And so uh, I'm sure you could add to our conversation and we look forward to hearing what you're doing. Just a little bit about City of Santa Cruz real briefly that we're located on the Central Coast. We're between Monterey and San Francisco. We have a population of over 65,000 residents. We're very much a tourist-based economy. We have the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, uh, Cowles Beach. We are the surf city of uh, California. We have 800 employees. We also have from 400 and sometimes up to 500 temp employees. We are full service with police, fire, water, sewer, garbage. So we, we have it all. Uh, and our general fund budget is 108 million. All right, hi everyone. This is Allison Hauk and I wanted to give you a little bit of information about the city of Monterey. We are also located on the Central Coast. Lisa and I actually live right, we live right next to each other and she goes north to Santa Cruz, I go south to Monterey. Um, we are a, again, obviously tourist-based um, destination. We have a population of uh, about half or a little less than half of Santa Cruz is 28,000. Um, but because we're tourist-based on any given day, that can be upwards of 100 plus thousand um, in normal circumstances. Unfortunately, um, because of the fact that we're so heavily reliant on tourism and um, Monterey has TOT, the uh, transient occupancy tax is our number one tax driver, our revenue source for the city because we have large hotels that kind of outpopulate the, um, uh, our property tax 
revenue base. So we have been hit very hard by the coronavirus. Um, we've seen an almost complete depletion of our TOT tax. 62% of our sales tax revenue also comes from tourism. So that is our second source of revenue has been devastated by this pandemic. So unfortunately, um, really horrible circumstance, but we had 500 full-time employees. We are down to approximately 400 as of next week. We had to lay off um, 106 positions, 82 of those were filled. We also had to um, stop scheduling all of our temporary employees. We had um, 400 temporary employees, we're down to 20 of those, just essential temporary employees. We are also a full service city. Um, we have police, fire. We also have a conference center um, that is right now closed. We also have a sports center that is also right now closed. <clears throat> Parking structures, we have a harbor, um, and then all of the other city services, parks and recreation, library, um, public works, um, and the like. So full service city. Our general fund budget in a normal year is around $80 million. All right, I'm going to tell, talk you through what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about um, guidance for implementing safe practices returning to work. So we definitely have some employees that have already been at work, public works, police and fire. Um, for many of you, you kept employees in the workplace, but maybe staggered schedules or just um, implemented safe practices. What we're going to do is really um, talk about how we're gearing up and what we're doing to implement new policies, procedures and protocols, preparing employees, and then also take your questions and answers. Um, so I'll just, we'll, we're still working through this process um, as far as how we're gonna implement people safely back to the workplace. And we are in, in the middle of it now, and this is all new as it is for all of you. So we're still working through it. And I think Lisa and I talk a lot to see what are you doing and we're implementing things maybe a little differently depending on what's gonna work for our cities. Um, so we wanted to just kind of have this conversational and talk about um, what you're doing, what we're doing, and what is on our minds as we develop these policies. So our first question is, why are we coming back to work? Uh, if, that, if that's the first question you might get from employees, why are we coming back to work? And what will your answer be? I can just talk a little bit about where I am in the city of Monterey. Um, we are still 100% remotely working if that is an option. So we have not started to integrate employees back to the workplace if their work can be done remotely. And there's a couple of reasons for that at my city. Part of it is because we were able to quickly remotely work. We had a number of laptops that we were able to check out for employees that didn't have that as an option. The, the first week that we sheltered in place, we put together a policy that allowed employees to actually just unplug their computers from their workstation, take home their chairs, get set up so that they could work remotely. We also had um, physical therapists at our sports center that were able to do ergonomic um, consultations with employees over the phone. So our first two weeks in shelter in place, we really geared up to be working remotely. We created a remote website and we pulled all of our information off our internet sites and put it up on a remote Google Hangout, a Google G Suite website. So employees could access most things that they would need to be in our network to access. And then we also uh, worked with our IT department to create a new system to allow employees to remote access and if they really needed to for their jobs. So because we were so well set up, we've stayed that way and we haven't started to integrate people back into the workplace. We are actually now developing a new policy to have that be the, the um, a potential long-term remote work option, um, as well as staggering schedules and things like that. So right now, the city of Monterey has not reintegrated unless people needed to be essential and in the field. And I know that Lisa's got a, a different um, practice that she's putting into place, so I'll let Lisa chime in here as well. Right. We, thank you, Alton. For we have integrated people back. We are doing a combination that uh, seems to be in our. We're in our second week of the combination, and what it really was is was a triggering event for us. And it, the interesting part was uh, the beach closures, that triggered for us to have to bring back a number of people to a enforce it, b do the signage. Uh, do the um, educational piece to it. So you may have a triggering event uh, like 
like ours is the, the beach closure or the governor's reopening plan or changes in the shelter in place. And interesting as I created these slides as early as you know yesterday, it's already changed this morning. Already you're seeing uh, different openings of different uh, retail, barbershops, restaurants, dine-in. And even for Allison and I, we're in two different counties and we actually have different uh, opening schedules and we're right next to each other. So for each of you, although there may be uh, differences as Alice and I are experiencing in our, our organizations, you will get there at some point and how you implement uh, really depends on, on your work environment and the job that they're doing, right? Versus a, a frontline employee versus a, a manager or a supervisor. And so that's keep in mind what these events are coming down the pike for you and how are you going to address that returning to work and what it looks like. And when they do come to work, uh, which is, I think is the next one slide. Let's see. Lisa, can we actually pause for a moment? Because yeah. we have some questions about the remote working um, that I thought we could address. One of them is, um, what do you do if remote working is not getting the job done? Um, and I wanted to just comment on that because we've been, um, the executive team, we've been talking about this and I think we're gonna continue having these discussions because I think different departments um, and frankly, just different people have different comfort levels with remote working, different comfort levels with supervising in a remote capacity. I will say with my team, I have a small team of six. We get on a Google Hangout every single morning. It's not hard for me to work with my team in a remote environment because there are six of them. And I actually think we might be more efficient right now. Um, we're getting more done and we're working at such a fast pace to get all these new policies implemented and institute the layoffs and do concession bargaining. But I know that a lot of larger departments are having a harder time with it. And so what we're developing is um, a longer term policy that actually puts together guidelines. Um, so, and, and I'm still developing those with the executive team, but what is your comfort level with who can work at home? So maybe it's only people that exceed expectations in a performance evaluation. Um, maybe it's only people that um, can, are showing that they are actually being, you know, uh, they're getting their work done, they're accountable for their work. So it's also gonna require some training on the part of our supervisors on how to manage somebody that's in the remote work environment. So we're also starting to do that as well. What does it mean to check in with your employees remotely? How do you oversee their work to see that there's accountability? Um, so that's something that we're working with right now. We're also really working with making sure that people have a safe environment to work and an ergonomic environment. So they're having to show us that they will be able to be in a workstation that is not gonna create workers' comp liability, that's not gonna create ergonomic issues. So we're really developing a very comprehensive policy where you know, we look at everyone's, we're looking at the city of San Francisco, Libra Cassidy's, we're kind of pulling together all of these different protocols from other places to see what's gonna fit with us. And I think the one thing that I will say is really important is that you want enough flexibility that each department can make their own determination and their comfort level. But at the same time, there should be some set standard for what would allow somebody to work from home because if we're pulling in too much discretion, you could get some favoritism claims and things like that. So I'm more comfortable and we're working on, you know, if somebody is exceeding expectations, then they can work from home or just some kind of real specific um, objective criteria to kind of make that first determination so that it's not just everyone can, or it's not just some that, you know, certain departments like or don't like or whatever people think is the issue. So we're really developing that right now. And I think that that's a really good process to talk about to get the comfort level of your executive team and where they're at. And then based off that, develop some guidelines for how everyone can implement it um, with some discretion, but also uniformly. We actually have a slide at the end where we'll go into a little more of the pluses and minuses because I think telecommuting is very um, hot on everybody's minds and how we're implementing. Uh, so when we get to that point, we can save some additional time so we can address a lot of those different issues that each of you probably have on your mind because we're implementing just almost the same but a, little, a slightly different. So if there's any other telecommuting questions, let's hold those to that particular section. We can probably wait. There's actually quite a few questions. So maybe we'll hold them till the end so we can get through all the information. Yeah, and then... let's do that. Okay. 
So the next one we touched a few things. I know you already probably know most of this, but returning to work, of course you understand it's not business as usual. Everything's gonna function completely different in this environment and be ready for the new normal. And then it's going to change again because these policies and procedures that we are all implementing are going to be refined. We're gonna get challenged, of course, if you haven't already been challenged by your labor unions on some of your policies. And then when we see potentially the, the, a second wave, how are we going to deal with that? And as Allison mentioned also, when we're talking about layoffs and furloughs, as many of your organizations are, you're starting to probably think about when those will be implemented, whether it's on the fiscal year, or you might be waiting until August to see if we're going to get any federal funding. So your work environment will change again. And I just keep reminding folks and my employees that to be ready for that, to be prepared mentally and physically for this to keeping such a dynamic and fluid situation. And the one key thing at all of this, when you are talking about returning your employees to work is employee protection is the number one priority. And that's what some of the policies that we're gonna discuss with you is that protection. What does it look like in all reality? Uh, how, how do you ensure your employees of that? So in terms of opening your, your work sites, there are, uh, did I skip a slide? Excuse me, let me look. A work location, yeah. Just to make a determination, which work sites are opening? Is it, for us, are we opening up the wharf to people coming into the city? Are we opening up parking? Are we opening up our uh, museums or offices? Which employees are you going to let work from home? And Allison touched on how to start making that determination. You can see that it's there's sometimes there's a distinct line between a frontline employee coming to work to an actual site because they maybe work in the parks or streets versus a supervisor within that same division may not have to come into work. And be prepared for the uh, a division in labor not being solely satisfied that they're not seeing their supervisor in the office and able to work from home and they're not. And how do you deal with those morale issues? And who has to report to the actual work site? And how often? So those are all of these different questions that you're going to face as you open up and you have got to be really prepared to how you're going to respond to these, these questions. And they will come at you, believe me, fast and furious and constantly. So just in terms of how I've done it here at the city, because we did open up about two weeks ago, but very, very slight movements, very staggered, uh, limited hours, limited people, and we'll talk about that. But what you need to do before you even begin to open and begin to communicate with your employees is have all your policies, your protocols, and your procedures ready to go they, and tightened up. Um, I can't stress enough that that's what your employees want and the labor groups are gonna to wanna to see that their employees are protected and safe. And this little picture here is just to show you my little, uh, when HR employees come in to my office, here's their temperature screening check, which we'll, we will talk about. And it's got the disinfectants, it's the non-contact uh, thermometer and all the instructions and their, how they record it. So we will get into each one of these policies a little more detail for you. And before they come to work, again, building trust that it's safe to return to work. I spent two weeks communicating with all of the city employees and then within my own department that it's going to be safe. And I had to model that behavior. You have to remember as HR directors, you've got to model wearing your face mask, taking your temperature and simplifying the process as best as you can if they actually report to the work site. Communicate those policies frequently often post them. That's a number one, uh, again, concern I, I heard a lot from the unions prior to coming in. And then even prior to them coming in, make sure you provide really good training to them and that they understand what the protocols are. So much so from like the minute they walk in the door, what is gonna happen when they turn the handle of the door to the office or open up the vehicle that they have to climb into 
how do they know that that is a protected environment for them and give them the tools to feel safe. Their mental health right now, as you can imagine, and your own mental health is so dependent on this, uh, our ability to make our employees feel safe. All right, we're gonna move into some of the policies and procedures. As we mentioned before, we have a lot of new policies and procedures that are in place. Um, it's an iterative process, they're changing. I'll just give you an idea of what we're doing at the city of Monterey. Um, we all have Gmail, so we all have the G Suite, and we've created a Google Doc that's shareable, that's viewable, can't be edited, but it's viewable by all employees, that has a number of new policies. Um, so we're going to go through some of the highlights of those new policies, but I will just let you know we have about, we have a testing policy, a social distancing policy, um, how to screen and do temperature checks, medical privacy policy, um, how to accommodate employees that are high risk, um, negative leave accrual policy if people have to quarantine because they were exposed. So just to give you an idea of the enormity of the, ch the changes that we're doing to shift people back to the workplace and doing so to maintain a health and safe, um, health, healthy and safe work environment. Um, so one of the things that we're doing as Lisa was talking about is social distancing. What does that mean? Uh, how do you social distance in the workplace? Putting in visual markers, reconfiguring workplaces so that people are six feet from each other making sure that break rooms, bathrooms have a plan so that people know ahead of time when they're entering a facility, how they have to behave in that play, in that facility. Um, you know, gathering sizes, looking at all of those things and marking them out to make sure we're doing it in a safe way. I will also let you know that the, one of the things that we did, Monterey has a spread out campus. Um, we have 25 different small buildings throughout the city of Monterey where we have our work site locations. So we have put together our safety committee that we usually meet on a monthly basis. We are meeting on a weekly basis right now. We've also identified one person that's responsible for each job site. So they are responsible for putting all of this information, all these markers and signs in place. And then just to give it another level, we're having um, our risk specialist out of HR is going to go through with a checklist for each job site location and do like a safety check like you would on your OSHA safety checks. They're gonna be doing an internal safety check to make sure that they can tell when they walk into a building that it's marked appropriately. So it's a lot of work. If you have a, a you know one city hall location that could tend to be a lot easier, but we have these 25 different buildings. So we wanted to make sure that we were um, making that we had that process in place. Um, we have a really robust safety committee right now, and part of that is because we had an OSHA audit two years ago, so it really got us to prepare for this. Um, but it has really helped to have a safety officer for each location, not necessarily each department or division, because sometimes divisions or departments have multiple locations, but one person in charge of each location. So we have a list of who that is. And that person has to check off that they've done all of these things. And then it goes to HR and HR goes and does a check before we have employees entering the workplace. Um, and that's how it's supposed to work in a perfect world. So we'll see it. We're just getting started with that process. Um, so also then, the, so that's like the worksite plan. And then for travel, um, social distancing, reducing and eliminating business travel so that we're not having people exposed outside of the workplace and then bringing back some exposure back. So when that's possible to also reduce um, travel and um, unnecessary meetings outside the local locality or state. I hear you using Google, the, uh, uh, not Google Docs. Google Suite. The Google Suite, which that was a new one, and I'd really be interested to hear if other people have had successes with their different remote access, you, such as Zoom or the other ones, which maybe at the end we could have, a, uh, people can type in what are some of their favorites that's worked best for them. I, but, yeah. yeah, I think SharePoint is also one that people have been using. Microsoft SharePoint, I think, is a bit more common than what we're doing. The nice thing about what we're doing is we have one policy that's like, a, it's came from the LCW toolkit. If anyone knew about that, LCWs for their consortium members have posted a toolkit that we then revise based off what's gonna work for our city. And we have one policy 
that is a return to work policy. And then within that policy, it's got 10 different links for our 10 new policies. Then it has checklists and best practices um, and all sorts of things in it. So it's one document that then links to a bunch of different documents. And we update it every week. So it's not like a frozen PDF that we have to keep reissuing. It's a, it's a living, breathing document that changes as the phase-in approaches happen. So that's something I think we've also really been having to kind of shift the way we do things as far as policies and protocols. It's not like you finished it, you print it off, and then you, you know, two years later, you're going to revise it. This is a daily revision. So what, how, what's the format that you can utilize to communicate in a way that can allow for modification and flexibility? Is, I think has really been important for us. Right. So many of you probably have already implemented, I have seen this floating around the health screening policy on a lot of the league listserv questions of what people are doing and how they're implementing health screening. It is mandatory uh, here at the city of Santa Cruz at all of the locations. And the way we've implemented it, it's not only mandatory for employees, but visitors, contractors, any other service providers who enter into our facilities have to uh, answer their health screening questions that we put together and they also have to do a temperature check and we are doing temperature checks uh self check and some people are having a supervisor check and there's i see a lot of questions floating around listserv about how are we doing it so ours is immediately when you walk into any of the facilities it's a temperature check with the non-contact thermometer and there's uh, disposable wipes there to with instructions literally step by step hold it you know, three centimeters from the bridge of your nose, disinfect the thermometer, disinfect the table, disinfect the disinfectant container, um, and record your uh, temperature. And now that is a, uh, and, and answer the health questions. Those are all, of course, confidential, and everybody's going to implement it slightly different. And you have to figure out what works best for you. What worked best in my department was that everybody has a log sheet. They keep the log physically on them so they can record it. There's no shared pens. You have to use your own pen. And then you keep that with you. And what I've had my employees do is then on time card day, then they submit it into an uh, envelope. And then I just make sure that everybody has been um, recording and, and be doing this. It's only been in place now for two weeks. Nobody seems to have uh, any problem with it. And then I keep it in a locked cabinet and I have no idea how long we have to keep that for, but it, it, maybe it'll be a historical museum artifact of some sort. Uh, and then in terms of what happens when, uh, you know, they get a high reading, we the, the instructions are there, you take it three times. If you get a th high reading, you have to immediately tell your, uh, and there's a, a threshold, I think it's 100.3, 100 100 point something point, like that. 100.4. Yeah. 100.4, thank you. And then you, um, you report to your employer, your supervisor and we send you home. That's our threshold. And if you answered yes to any of those questions, we send you home. You're hoping that people are now educated enough to know not to come to work if they have any of those symptoms. And we keep reminding them obviously of those symptoms because what, people become complacent and we have to prevent that from happening. So then what's the threshold for um, not only sending them home, but then allowing them to return to work. So our health screening policy has, you have to be symptom free for 72 hours. Again, that we checked the CDC website, you know, that's already, is changing. So as Allison was saying, these policies are, are constantly changing in terms of uh, when, even when you get an exposure, which is another one of our um, slides to talk about that policy. But those are the, the basics that we're doing in terms of health screening and required postings before you get into the door uh, back to the uh, allowing, you know, social distancing. We've limited the number of people in our lobbies. You have to knock before you come in. We've changed our uh, hours of operation for the public. We've gone, the, one of the good things I think you probably all are experiencing too is completely finally, which it was pulling teeth, but all of our recruitments now, we do not accept paper applications. It's all online. And then our, our requisition process now for well, when we start hiring again, <laughs> will be all electronic. Uh, all of our, we're making things by appointment only. We, we're doing a number of uh, wholesale work changes to accommodate the employee's needs, but our need to be safe as well. And it's, 
the new ideas, the creativity that's coming from our employees as they live through some of these things has been really great, which we'll talk a little bit more about checking in with, with your employees. Okay, let me get to the next one. Um, okay. This, you're on mute, Allison. Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, so protective equipment, um, right now, because I think, you know, there might be, Lisa might want to chime in too with some of these things, just because we are still working with just our public works, police and fire, and then some essential workers that support those departments are coming in. Everyone else is at home. Um, but when people do come into the office, facial coverings are required um, when they are around other people. Um, if they are, we're still working with, you know, what happens if you are, if you're in a cubicle environment and you're potentially nearby other people, whether or not you need to wear those or not, at least I might want to talk about those things because those are the things we're going through in our safety committee discussions right now about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Um, so, and, and that's also, quite frankly, keeping us from having employees stay home re working remotely so that we don't have to make all these decisions all at once. We're sort of triaging our decision process because there's so much to think about and do right now. Um, but we wanna make sure that we have all those disinfectants, um, keeping them in one, we're keep, we wanna make sure also every single of our 25 different locations, everyone knows where you can get these supplies. So if you run out of disinfectant, there's a sign up to say, where can you get all of these supplies, like cleaning supplies, disinfectant supplies, hand sanitation, so that it's easy to access. Um, and also we have, uh, we've actually utilized our EOC, um, our emergency operations uh, center to be purchasing and getting these supplies. So there's one central location um, in HR. We just didn't have the capacity to take that on right now with all the concessions and everything going on. So our EOC has been um, getting face masks, getting hygiene equipment, cleaning and hygiene equipment, and then they are distributing it to each location at, when a safety officer from that location requests it and puts in how much they need. So we're kind of doing that um, centralized. Um, and then, you know, we are going to have to be changing the way that our offices look. Um, we are putting up those um, partitions, the plexiglass partitions, um, at all of our office counters. We are doing the same thing that Lisa said by appointment only. Um, so one of the things we're struggling with right now, and maybe Lisa's had um, further along with this, but because we've been so much closed to the public and we're starting to open it for by appointment and having some limited office hours, um, certainly like our building inspection and public works, our planning departments have still been open. So what we're trying to figure out is what is the role of HR and our safety committee for keeping our employees safe? And then when is it the role of the departments to determine how they're gonna require the public to maintain safe, safe practices? So it's a bit of a balance because sometimes public can act in a way that exposes our employees. So in that role, I've said, okay, HR needs to take that on because it's gonna impact our employees. But then there's also the idea of if we are maintaining a certain environment and it's public, how much do we wanna show the public how to behave and what sort of social distancing and protective wear they're supposed to have um, when they're on city location. So that's a bit of a balance that we're kind of dancing around right now is like whose who's lane is this to make a determination about you know what you do and how you do it. So right now I'm just saying anytime it impacts an employee then I want to know about it and I want us to think about it in our safety committee and then make a decision about how we're going to deal with it as far as what protective gear and equipment is needed and barriers and things like that. Lisa, I don't know if you want to- Yeah, we're the same, doing the same thing. We put partitions up. We're limiting the number of people come in. We're required to wear a face mask. And if we have a problem, yeah, I, it's, coming to, it's coming to HR to help, but the, the departments, we're trying to have a consistent standard as, as much as possible, but, but trying to be flexible as well. Um, and then I, we have had irate people come up and they're frustrated. They're just as angry and they want their house built. They want their house inspected and their bathroom and their toilets to work. And, and they're, you're not that, as responsive as they want to be, but uh, it's, it, you have to deal with those two. And how, how do we manage that in this time? Um, it, and how, actually we have started also continuing our, uh, when you not disengage, I'm, I'm just drawing a blank on the word, but de-escalation. 
reminder of some of these things that you're going to have to try to implement and train your front counter people of de-escalation de policies because it's going to get a little bit difficult. Okay. Um, in the sake of time, I'm going to go through some of these a little quicker because I want to be able to get to your questions. This is the last detailed policy we'll go through and then we'll tell a little bit of um, the telecommuting and a little bit on leave and disaster service. So we'll just briefly glide over those so we can get to your questions. But this one's a tough one because even again, it's changing. What's, what do you do if there's an exposure on your work site? Your employees want to know that there's a plan in place that if somebody tests positive or feels sick at work and they still came to work and they went home, what are you going to do? What's your policy that you have in place? And there's a difference between, we have followed a policy of the dis difference between exposure or versus a contact. Um, and so, but starting from the beginning, who's responsible? You, you also have to remind employees that they're also responsible for wearing their uh, personal protective gear to set, practice safe measures. And it's really important for the supervisor to enforce these measures. When you see your employees not wearing face masks, you, if that's your requirement, make them wear it. Make them uh, be social distancing. Do everything you can to make your employees feel safe and protected. And it really, really starts with your leadership, even with your city manager. Are they walking down the street and going to coffee without their mask on? It's just that simple. Or showing up in a group meeting and not having their mask on. There's a number of different things that the supervisors really need to be held accountable for. And then what happens when you have a contact or exposure? And the difference that we've been, we've been working on is a contact's in close proximity, but they're wearing their protective gear. That's your contact. Does that mean that you're going to get it? Not necessarily. If you, we won't send somebody home uh, to self-quarantine under that, um, that, that example. But as versus an exposure, if you were in proximity with somebody for a extended period of time and you're asymptomatic and you were unprotected and they were unprotected, there's where we start to we get uh, send people home to monitor their symptoms for 72 hours prior to coming back. You know, and the science is all over the board. We understand that. And whether your, your temperature check is um, consistent or not. But we have, uh, so we have a policy in place. We also, in terms of reporting, notification, and cleaning, immediately you, have, you should have a, a protocol for how you're gonna clean that vehicle, the break room, everywhere that that individual who may have been in contact with, and it happens immediately, shut, you down, shut down that space for at least the next 24 hours. Whether or not it's scientifically proven or not, it gives your other employees a great sense of relief that that's happening. And in terms of notifying, you, again, walking that fine line of HIPAA, of who went home sick, it spreads like rapid fire. You know they all are gossiping and talking to each other, and then they talk to their union, and what are you going to do? I mean, I had that call. I'm sure many of you have experienced that call as well. Um, and so we do want to, we tell them, we, we tell the individuals that we do sort of a trace contact of see who they were in contact with, who did they work with. Uh, and hopefully, because we've been practicing these measures, we've been social distancing, we disinfect, we're doing all these different things that we can ensure that they are not going to get sick. And we actually have had three potential exposures in the workplace, but none of them proved to be uh, anything other than allergies or um, just a brief illness. But again, the testing, sometimes it's been uh, positive and sometimes it's negative incorrectly. We all know that. So better to be error on the side of caution than uh, allow the, the exposure to, to um, drive the fear and, and have that liability for you. Uh, Allison, do you have anything on, on exposure, contacts, what to do? Sorry, my mouse is playing games with me. Um, no, I, I, we just, we put up a really easy flow chart to try to figure out, like, we're trying to make our policies really user friendly, which is hard to do with so much information. But if an employee hasn't tested positive, but they have symptoms, what do you do? If an employee has tested positive, what do you do? If somebody at their house has tested positive, what do you do? And it's a bit um, duplicative, but we have sort of like every situation that you might think of, like a, you know, question and answer. So we're trying to really break down our policies for that, yeah. thinking through all those different options. And that's, um, it's just something, and again, as it's changing, this policy has changed dramatically since the beginning of this. Um, you know, in the first like two weeks, 
we sent a firefighter home for two weeks and then we're like, nope, you can come back, <laughs> you know? So it's been a changing and evolving process. Um, but that's, that is, uh, yeah, having those policies in place and then um, we're doing the best that we can. So, yeah. okay, telecommuting. That's you. Okay, so we already talked a lot about this, but just again, um, telecommuting, um, new paradigm for the public sector, maybe, right? So I know there's different comfort levels and I will say within my own city, varying degrees of comfort with this. Um, it does provide flexibility, less commuting, child care options right now with schools closed, closed camps not in full swing. Um, expanded applicant pool. I know that we've all talked about how to get millennials and then the generation behind them into our workplaces. And if Google and Twitter and all of those places start allowing telecommuting, how are we going to keep up with that? So that is on all of our HR minds. Um, and then workers' compensation liability. Right now we've got, you know, some of the presumptions through the summer. Um, part of the summer, and if they are at home and they get exposed, it's unlikely workers' compensation. If they are in the workplace and they get COVID, very possibly it is your liability on workers' comp. So that's something to think about. Um, and then again, as I was saying, workplace, um, your homework station, other liability if they get hurt, um, and the accountability expectations and training. I am of the mind that we can kind of shift the way that we supervise and have that accountability built in. Um, but I, again, I know it's gonna be different for different styles and different types of work and different needs as far as, you know, if you're an engineer and you need CAD and what kind of internet you need to have at home. And there's so many different factors. So I think it needs to be a flexible um, process. But I do think that right now, we are encouraging it because we are still in this kind of wait and see what's gonna happen. And also with Monterey having to do layoffs, which most cities aren't in the same place that we're in. I think they're doing furloughs and other things. We are also doing concession bargaining, but because of the fact that we have such a huge TOT revenue and sales tax that has now been depleted, um, we are so focused on the layoffs and the concessions right now that I am really slowly rolling out the safe work practices just because quite frankly there's five in my team and we can't get it all done so we're triaging as i said before so we're bringing people back as we have the ability and the staff capacity to do it in a safe manner and until we get there we're going to do it in a very slow way and that might not be the, the same situation for many other cities i would just like to say in terms of we don't have to reinvent the wheel on this and the public sector has been doing it for so long that, I mean, the private sector, excuse me, that they have good policies and procedures. And this is the time to really tap that market, that brain power of how do they make it work so that employees or, or um, supervisors or managers feel that they, this is a good thing and they trust that the process can work and they can trust that people are, are uh, doing the work that they're doing. So I think that there's so much growth here. Uh, and again, we can count on each other to pass these policies around each other and tap into the, the private sector, how they're doing it. Okay. Uh, what happened here? Hmm. Oh, I did a little trick there. <laughs> I didn't even know. Uh, All right, so leave policies. Um, so uh, many cities are lifting the accrual caps on their um, vacation accruals. We just negotiated vacation accrual caps. The first week in March, we closed our contracts before this all happened. So we just negotiated that. And we have been um, not lifting that again because we, we're saying goodbye to 84 people this week. And so we're saying, we're not gonna be giving people more vacation while we're saying goodbye to 84 people who are losing their jobs. And these are temporary layoffs. We are gonna try as soon as we can to bring people back temporary layoffs, but they are layoffs. So we have a bit of a different thing happening. Um, but there is, it is really um, important to think about all these different leaves. We have new policies for the new federal family parental leave, the new emergency paid sick leave. Many cities, including ours, gave a, um, additional leave during the first period before those federal laws came into place. Um, so we won't spend too much time on that because I think there's a lot of other questions, but forced use of unpaid leave, due process, um, what do you need to do before that happens if that's something you're going to do, or are you just going to keep people on paid leave status if they need to quarantine and they're out of leaves? 
all of those different things are something that you need to think about and consider a consistent policy for how you're going to apply it and potentially meet and confer on it as well. Um, so that's just to tap in as something to keep on the keep on the radar. Um, and then uh, disaster service workers. Um, I don't know about many of you, but for us, it was news to a lot of our employees that they were in fact disaster service workers. It's on all of our job descriptions, but what does it mean? What are their you know obligations? Um, I will say that a lot of times when employees are saying like they don't want to do something, um, like the being, uh, being a safety officer, they don't want to do that. It's not in their job description. A lot of these things we have been saying, you are a disaster service worker to ensure safety in our environment. There's other things that you need to do as part of your job. I think that's okay to a certain extent, but we don't want to take advantage of that um, to go too far with it. But it does allow us to utilize our employees in a way that is not within the four corners of their job description as far as what their duties are for their particular job. Um, but something to be mindful of to not take that too far. Okay. I just want to, again, to try to get to your questions because there's a lot of them. And finally, just to wrap it up, really taking care of your employees. This is just so, so important to us and I think to all of you, the, the support services that they need to have access to for their mental health, the EAP, each other, physical well-being, staying connected, hold regular staff meetings or one-on-one, -on -one, communicate often about what's happening, follow up with your employees regularly, make sure that they are okay and that they're doing okay at home too, if they're at home with their kids. And just in closing, you know, continue the work that you've all probably been focused on, a lot of you on organizational culture. We have to maintain a healthy, functional, supportive, creative workplace, even more so now and rethinking how we're gonna do team building. And then of course, don't stop if you're doing employee engagement and recognition. Even more now in this crisis time, we've got to take care of our employees and help them and support them. And not only them, but yourselves. And don't forget about your directors, your co coworkers, your executives. They're putting in long, long hours. And what are we going to do? You know, Because HR, we are the be all end all, right? How are we gonna help them? I just wanna close by saying thank you so much for, for tuning in. And I wanna just jump right into the questions so that yeah. we can answer them. And Megan, do you wanna facilitate that? Yes. Can we go to the next slide? I don't know if I have capability yet. We are gonna take over the slides. We can do this. Can we do one more slide? Perfect. So there's two ways to ask a question. You can either raise your hand and we will call on you and you can verbally ask or you can use that Q&A box, which many of you have done. Uh, ladies, we do have a lot of questions and I wanna make sure that you get to a lot of, to answer as many as we can. Um, Allison, can you share, can you forward your flow chart? Sure. Perfect. There's, yes, they're in Google Docs. So I don't know if I should do it in Google Docs or we'll see, we can talk. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk. So we will try to get that flow chart out to everyone. Okay, so I'm gonna try to take them in batches so we can um, answer them around the same time. Uh, temperatures, you both indicated that uh, you're looking at taking temperatures. Are you taking the public's temperature when they come in? We haven't, uh, I'll, I'll take that real quick. We haven't opened to the public our counters just yet for the most part. Um, no, the, like in PD, they're opened up their counter. No, they haven't taken their temperatures, but they have the health screening questions prior to entering and wearing a mask before they can enter. In some of our locations, um, it's you have to knock so that we can um, control the entry in. But no, we're not doing temperatures of the public. That is the same for us at this time. Do you need to have a medical personnel training on the team to take those temperatures? No, we, we don't believe that you do. We're just, and that's why we're doing self-check and uh, that, that removes that liability from us. That's what we oh, do. Good. Yeah, you don't um, need to. And we are as well. We're having people on a Google form on their phone if they have a smartphone, just log into a secured sheet that says pass fail on their temperature checks. You do want to make sure though how you're handling that information and um, you know, you're not writing down people's temperature. It, it, be careful about that. And then also, if somebody does um, test positive or have a high temperature, all of that information, just remember that uh, you need to keep their names confidential. Uh, we do need to engage in contract tracing to the extent that we can, but you should not be sharing people's names with their medical information, like this person has a high temperature, this person got tested positive with COVID. 
we do not want to be sharing. So remind all of your supervisors to not be sharing employees' names. Just something to think about. Okay, we answered that one. Um, let's go back to the beginning. Um, you have you are doing layoffs and have and pay cuts or either or. Um, so our executive team has all taken a um, voluntary pay cut. Um, they've deferred a 2% cost of living increase in July and then taken an 8% cut in salary. Um, we are working um, to negotiate with our other unions. Some of our other management groups have also agreed to voluntary pay cuts. Our layoffs right now, um, we did, because, because we have to meet and confer on any concessions, we did propose layoffs through our layoff process, which are layoffs. Um, and we did reach out to all of our bargaining units saying if we could have some concessions, we might be able to alleviate these. Our deficit is so huge this year. We have a $10 million or $13 million deficit to close out this fiscal year out of an $80 million general fund. So there wasn't much they could do um, to, unless we were talking about like 30, 40% cuts. So we did the layoffs um, that are temporary. We hope we actually are bringing back eight people. So from the layoff list this week, because we're gonna open our parking structures. Um, but we are going to try to get people back as Parks and Rec can reopen, Sports Center can reopen, Conference Center can reopen. But we've also lost all those revenue drivers, right? So we're not having the Parks and Rec, Sports Center fees, conference fees, bring in the revenue that supports the staff. So ours are not furloughs, they are layoffs, but we are committed to working and bring them back. We're doing so. furloughs. Well, no, we're, we're seeking 10% salary uh, uh, personnel reductions and how groups are taking it is differently. Some people are doing a increased first contribution we're in the middle of the concessions right now, and uh, we are also seeking them from public safety. That means fire and uh, police that we have. And in order to implement those, you, we have to have different operational plans. So I'm working very closely with the chiefs to see if I can't get that to work. And when you made these decisions, um, did you, how did that come about? Did you talk to the electeds? Uh, we started with the, obviously our financial projections. And then right away, you know, our executive team, we had a, a policy decision a group. We uh, looked at how are we gonna tackle this, not doing uh, layoffs or furloughs, uh, how could, what other things could we cut? And the employee groups wanted to see how, how are we cutting other things? Are we using reserves? So we came at it with a, a full plan. And then uh, we did talk about it with the council, of course, and we, we did go to uh, open session. And both, Al I took a lot of information from Allison because she went ahead of me and I uh, took my lesson from her of how to uh, communicate with the unions that we were gonna seek personnel cuts. Uh, I learned from her that I did it literally uh, an hour before it was announced that that was the route we were going because I didn't want the unions to run rampant and start you know, just communicating all over the place, misinformation. So we did it, like I said, um, about literally an hour before we went to the council. And you both have indicated uh, hiring freezes for your cities? Yes. Is that pretty typical in your area that you've heard? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the now employee travel, are you requiring any uh, employees that are traveling uh, to be, I'm sorry, are you requiring anything for employees who are traveling out of the area or on planes? Um, I'm are not. <laughs> are you, so you're not, you're not gonna quarantine them for 14 days and have them telecommute? No, I'm not. I so think. we are doing something a little bit different. So right now under the County of Monterey, we are under a shelter in place for non-essential travel. Um, many of our employees don't live in Monterey County though, and they might live in other uh, counties that don't have the same restrictions. We are in the process of trying to figure out the right balance. Um, there are, you know, constitutional right to travel. There's the labor code that says that you can't, you know, for people lawful off-duty conduct, we can't discipline them. Um, but there's also a shelter in place order, which does allow us to make some changes on what would be constitutional rights to travel. So we are kind of striking a balance and I think where we're landed and I wouldn't, um, I don't know yet, but I think what we're going to do is we are going to kind of lay out our shelter in place requirements for essential travel, the CDC's guidelines on travel. And then we are going to let people know that if they do get on a plane or if they travel to an area, we've already had people leave from Mexico. Um, so what does that mean? And it's going to be different if you're a telecommuter.
you can quarantine for 14 days and still telecommute. If you're not, if you're an essential worker, now that we're getting into the summer season and people haven't been taking vacations, if they take a vacation that exposes themselves and then not only are they out for one or two weeks, but then 14 days quarantine, can we prohibit that travel? Yeah. We are really yeah. working with that right now because we've actually had some situations happen that make us have this be what we're what, a determination that we're making. Um, so, but we, again, we're having like, whether or not our city attorney wants to approve some of the things that departments want to do, we're working through that process and we're going to come out with a travel policy um, that I think will tell employees, here's what the parameters are. We're not going to, I don't really like to ask people too much about their personal plans outside of the workplace. So I want to be really mindful of their privacy, but also mindful of our health and safety. So it's striking that balance. Yeah. So my thought is to say, here's the guidelines, and we want you to attest to the fact that you're not going to pro, you're not going to put us at risk by not violating these plans. And if you do, you're going to self quarantine on your own leave um, or unpaid leave, something along those lines. So we're working through what that model is going to look like. But again, it's that yeah, it's that balance that we're trying to strike right now. Um, because I don't want people going outside the area and coming back and exposing our employees. Again, there's that workers' comp liability, uh, OSHA health and safety requirements. We wanna make sure we're not exposing our employees unnecessarily. So any employee that is, is, has been exposed, are they sent home? We have a difference between exposure and contact. So we, we make the difference of what does that mean? So when the, what is it, were you exposed to somebody who tested positive? And were you wearing personal protective gear? What, what's the circumstances before we say, no, you're not coming back to work, if you're asymptomatic, right? If, you, if you're not exposed, yeah. if you have no symptoms. So um, currently, you know, that's a bit of a controversy with the CDC is saying that if you're asymptomatic and you can still come back to, you can come to uh, work if you don't have, you know, personal symptoms. So we wanna know what the circumstances were and uh, because just saying you're exposed isn't necessarily mean that you're, you've, you've got it. We're trying to err on the side of caution, but at the same time, uh, we do have folks who would like to use that uh, once every Monday and Friday. So we have to be careful of that. Are you planning on testing employees? We're not testing, but we there is a facility now that's opened in uh, two facilities here in Santa Cruz, one in Watsonville as well, in our community, that is for essential workers. We're not telling them to go get tested because it's a point in time in a sense, but we are definitely encouraging that if, to, to go ahead and, and utilize it because it's free to essential workers. We're doing the same thing. It's, there's a location that's allowing testing, but we were uh, fortunate to have a um, scientist approach us and ask if our police and fire officers would be willing to do testing. It's voluntary and they do both the antibody test and the COVID test. And they're doing that um, all the time. So our police and fire officers are being tested um, if they want to participate in this study. So we do have testing for some of our employees. And I think there's other places out there that are doing that right now. So it's something to tap into if you're interested. I'm not sure where you find that out, but I know that that's something that our police chief was able to secure. So um, talking about police chief, police officers, wearing masks have been an issue. Are you requiring police officers to wear masks in the police station? I'm smiling. Are you going to take it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as you all know, sometimes police and fire like to do their own things and not necessarily tell HR. I mean, please. Um, or tell us that they're not doing our recommendation. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yes, we required it, but are they doing it? If I peek my head, well, I can't, I have to walk over there. I would tell you, I'll bet you they're not. I, and I have had multiple conversations and they're supposed to be wearing them out. They are wearing them out in public and, with, and that's because it's visible, right? But I don't know that they're doing it in the station, but they are in public. Um, you know, we've also told like our fire departments not to be having shared meals, um, whether or not they're abiding by all of those things because they're living together. I don't know. Ladies, we have hit our time. Do you have time for uh, some quick questions? Yeah. Uh, are you reinstating community recreation and child care programs? We are. We, uh, on a limited basis, we are, we are doing some programs 
with all the social distancing requirements that the state is laying out for us. Um, and with the easing up it, like just today of the phase two, we might offer a few more programs. But our biggest one, you know, for us, Junior Guards is this huge program. And uh, no, we're, some of our biggest ones we're not doing. We are, unfortunately, we are, we are gearing up to try to do it, but uh, we don't have any funding to do it. We are decimated more than most again. So um, we're trying to figure out how to do some small camps this summer with 100% cost recovery. We've always uh, subsidized our recreation programs. So we are only going to be able to offer those, I think, to start with that we get 100% cost recovery. So we're all looking like, you know, first camps for essential workers and things like that in a small scale. Um, a lot of people are asking if you have any policies you can share, please let us know and we can share them with them. Uh, how do you envision the future of community outreach engagements will be conducted? How will this impact, how will your staff be impacted by this? Has anyone talked about the community impacts? Uh, for us, but in terms, I'm just trying to think of community impacts. I actually think it's increased immensely. The number of people who are participating in our council meetings mm -hmm. has doubled. Well, and when we have a very controversial council and, and it's not, feels, doesn't necessarily feel safe to come into our council meetings sometimes. So the participation is just doubled. It's been great. Our, our commissions, we're starting to, you know, we're doing those uh, virtual and those have been great. I, I feel like this is a new way to engage in our community and, you know, tell me how many times you've had budget hearings and, and you try to go out to the community to get them to get their input and you just get the same players every time. Well, when we did ours, it was so many more people uh, tuned in and had their questions and it was really, um, it was great. I, I think this is going to totally change how we communicate with the community. Same with us. We've been doing YouTube streaming and then we have like a call-in for questions for public, public comment. I think everyone's kind of pivoted to that. And it does seem like we have a lot more um, viewers, not necessarily a lot more public comment, but a lot more viewers. Yeah. So regards with uh, workspace, um, you know, employees need to eat lunch. How are you handling social distancing with lunch rooms? Are you allowing uh, employees to use the lunch rooms and the cafeterias and the refrigerators or um, do they have to just keep everything at their desk? We are letting people do it, but there's a limited number of people and we've got the stickers on the floors to say okay. where you can be so we can limit that. And then uh, we have all the cleaning and sanitizing supplies there to, uh, to do after every usage. And then, you know, we said no more shared food kind of thing. And so of course your people are gonna find a way around it. So one of my guys brought in, um, cookies and what he did was he individually bagged them and had them sitting all out there. You know, there's things that your employees are still wanting to reach out and do these kinds of things. And so I'm trying to do it, uh, you know, we're all trying to do it in moderation, but the cleaning and the hand sanitizing is everywhere and the demarcations on the floor are everywhere, signage is everywhere. In staggered breaks, I think we're working with that. And I again, I think we're pretty we're pretty unique in that we have really small work sites. We have really small number of employees at each location typically. So it's working a little bit easier for us. I know, yeah, central city halls or civic centers, it's a lot trickier when you've got a large, we don't have anything like a cafeteria. We have small little break rooms. So um, given these new circumstances, there have been um, different work schedules for different people now that kids aren't in schools. How are you handling people who can't work those traditional city hall hours who now have to work evenings and weekends? How are you managing them? So I'm one of them. I have two little ones. So I'm pretty flexible on it. And I'm encouraging people to be flexible because I feel like I have a um, firsthand knowledge of what it's like to have a kindergartner and a second grader um, run in at all times even when the doors close and they're no they're not supposed to come in i'm surprised we haven't had a guest appearance here <laughs> um so we are trying to this extent we can let people do that um and just checking in i'm really trying to keep you know supervisors checking in with their employees like every couple of days at least i'm checking in with mine every day um to see what are you going to accomplish today and then the next day what did you accomplish and what are you going to accomplish you know just really setting out some goals and expectations um, on a more granular level than usual for the week, for the day. Um, and trying to remind employees though, to take those breaks. 
and to self-care, you know, we're really pushing our EAP program and all of those things. But I, I mean, it's a massive balance right now. Um, you know, employees might get in 20 minutes here, 30 minutes there, 15 here. And so I, right now we're trying to be as flexible as possible. I know that um, patients will run thin the longer this goes, but so far it hasn't, we haven't had too, too many issues with it at all. Yeah, I, I, I have, um, because I've asked people to come back to work and I want them right now in the office a minimum of two, two days a week. And I do have an individual who doesn't uh, have a, can't really remotely work and she does have a young one and I'm just trying to be flexible. If she wants to come in on the weekends, um, I have asked her, she has to use the FMLA portion of the federal leave to cover some of those hours uh, that she's not here until her school kicks in. So trying to be flexible, but I also, um, I would say I'm a little more having to be consistent with the um, other directors who are a little are more a little more rigid on some of these things, so it's a balance. Try to figure it out. Have you provided your employees any kind of training, like PowerPoints, or any um, your What have you provided your employees? Uh, some people like to know. Um, well, we've done a we've been doing some trainings um, on a weekly basis. We did one on like how to like self care and like um, mm -hmm. what does resiliency mean and how to be resilient and what is EAP and you know we did something like that. Um, we also have a lot of training tools and uh, videos that we've put up online on like how to use the G Suite, how to do this, like um, and so. Um, we also did like a lot of training on how to decide what kind of leave you need to use right now. So we've been doing Google Hangout meetings where we can have like 200 people at a time. So we've just been doing a lot more really quick, smaller trainings where we have 200 employees jump on on a Friday. And then we do questions and answers with HR. We've been doing that a lot. Like just what are your questions and answers? What can we help you with um, to try to facilitate people getting and you know, they can do it. They can ask questions anonymously, but then we'll answer them in a public way so that everyone can hear these questions. So we've been doing a lot of that more than we've ever done um, as far as just opening an HR up to any questions you have. It's, it's a tough time to be socially distanced, but emotionally close. It's a tough balance. Yeah. Um, ladies, oops, that was my fault. Uh, we are gonna go to the final thought. Do you have anything that you would like to add to or um, you guys gave a lot of information. Is there anything more that you would like to say to our members? I think I would just want to say one is um, utilize the listservs and utilize emailing each other so we can all support each other. I think the one thing that's really helped me get through and trying to be on the forefront of all of this is my constant reaching out to other HR directors or the listservs and getting all the ideas. Um, to, to get us through this and, and to support each other. I think HR is different than any of the other um, pieces of this whole puzzle. And we're really the glue that's holding it together. And who's gonna hold us together uh, mm -hmm. is, I think that's the, the one of the most important things to do is to, to rely on your contacts, uh, utilize each other. I, Alice and I are like an open book and I have all my policies, people are considering asking, they're all on our internet side that you can access under the COVID bar and figure your way out to HR, but um, ask the questions and, and don't feel like you're out there alone because you're not. This is, this is hard. We're all in this trying to figure it out and it's not easy. Yeah, and I would just say, I think we should all gear up for a difficult year ahead. I think that um, we're feeling the impacts right now, I think Monterey because of the TOT, but you know, as this endures and if it endures, I think other cities are going to start also struggling. I mean, all of them are right now, but to a larger extent when property tax might be hit more because of all the unemployment. And I just think realize it's a long road ahead. And I'm trying to rem remind my staff to just really pace ourselves. We can't get it all done in a day. Triage what's most important, what's not most important. Um, and, you know, celebrate those small wins. Yesterday, we just realized that we could bring two more people off the layoff list. And we all just like, really had a moment to celebrate. It was like a big win. So just think about what are those small things that you can celebrate and just hang hang in there. It's I think it's a marathon. I, we thought it was a sprint in March, but it's a marathon. So pivot and kind of, you know, figure out how you're gonna 
endure it in the long haul and start thinking flexibly and everything's new. And if you get it wrong, we're all getting it wrong. We're all getting it right. Every day is a different day. So just take it one day at a time. Totally. And that is great final thoughts. This is a marathon, not a sprint. And we are all in this together in these uncertain times. So at least we can come together because we know what's going on and all feeling the same thoughts. I don't know if I can get to the next slide. Oh, oh there we go. The next slide. Please join us next Tuesday, June 2nd at 11 a.m. We will have the LA Times Sacramento Bureau Chief John Myers explaining his thoughts on the new um, environment in the political world. Ooh. So please register for that. Um, I would like to declare this one a huge win. You both have been such amazing speakers and, has get, and you've given us so much great information. Thank you so much, ladies. We really appreciate all the time that you have spent uh, helping all of us. And please, thank you so much. Um, and everyone out there, this will be hosted on the league's website, backslash coronavirus. Everyone take care. <laughs>